This is The Backstory with Amobola Steven. It's a balanced, objective, unbiased and disruptive conversation on government and politics. We shine more light on what has not worked and what would make it work. And now, to the finest, personable and engaging host extraordinaire, Amobola Steven. Tune in. Good to have you on the show once again. This is Amobola Steven. You're always on the backstory with Amobola Steven. On the backstory with Amobola Steven, we would like to focus on what has not worked and what we make it work, focusing on government and politics topics. On today's show, I have Lavi Sharp, who is an engaging speaker, a marine veteran teacher, and also a political activist. Welcome with me on the backstory, Larry Sharp. Hey, how are you? So happy to be here. So happy to have you, Larry Sharp. Now we'll be talking more about government and politics. Um, really looking forward to a watch right time with you on the show today. Um, Lavi, your mission really is to help people find happiness um, through um, community and purpose. So how do you hope to achieve this? Yeah, you know, the one of the things you you can't do is just order it. And sadly, governments often do that. They just go, well, we need something to happen, so we'll pass a law and make it happen. That's not how it works. What actually works is you want to use your, your government to create an environment to where people will strive for happiness on their own. That's not easy to do. It's much easier to say, I'm going to pass a law and force people to be happy. <laughs> that never works. So what I want to do is create an environment to where people have the best chance of moving forward. And what does that mean? That means having a, a, a government that only wants to punish people when they create victims. If there's no victim, there is no crime. Let people go out and do the things they want to do. Now, you might say, Larry, what about safety? I'm for safety. I think safety is important. So government can create guidelines, guidelines that people can see and go, oh, these are safety guidelines. And as long as the people who are out in their community are open and transparent about what guidelines they have, now your community can decide who is safe and who isn't safe and who they trust. There's another piece. I want government to encourage more than one set of guidelines. Government can have a guideline, so can a private organization, so can a religious organization. Other people can have other guidelines that people can follow the best of their ability. There is no perfect answer, but here's what I'm sure of. When you create a monopoly, you're going to get corruption, you're going to have negativity. If you have more choices, more options, you won't have perfect outcomes, but you'll have better outcomes. Right. Now, I'd like us to um, delve more into uh, your career as um, once a 2018 Libertarian New York State gubernatorial candidate. Now, um, what were some of the highlights of your manifesto, um, which you think we're missing in the then government of the day? Now, in terms of yeah. um, the law and regulation in the community. Sure. One of the things is we have decided that the only way for us to raise money to help people who are in trouble is taxation. And that is not the only way. That's that's one way. The problem with making it taxation is now even the poor people are paying taxes and wealthy people always find a way to not pay taxes. They literally have armies of lawyers and armies of uh, accountants to not pay taxes. Or in the worst case, they just pack up and move. And that's what's been happening in New York State for years. We've been losing 100,000 or more people every single year and we have a wealth transfer of about $23 billion has left our state and gone to either Florida or Texas. And what's the common thing in Florida and Texas? They have no state income tax. So the wealthy will always leave. So how can I get the wealthy to pay for people who need help? Well, the left um, in my party, in my, in my country says, we want the wealthy to pay. Okay, great. The right says, we don't want more taxes. Okay, great. So why can't I make an environment to where, for example, across New York City, we have many bridges and tunnels. And we name our bridges and tunnels. And we name them after previous people who've been governors and presidents and leaders. I say, scratch that. Don't do that. It's a bad idea. Lease out naming rights to large organizations. Make the Pepsi bridge, the Amazon bridge, the Google bridge, the I don't care, name the bridge. They will pay us $100 million every single year to have the name on that bridge. We'll front load the contract. We'll do a 10, 12 year contract will raise money to pay for things like our subway system, our bus system. Who used the subway and the buses? The working poor and the middle class use those. So now the wealthy will pay for the working poor and the middle class to have a better lifestyle without taxation and let the poor paying. 
These are the kind of ideas that I want to create more and more and more. Getting the wealthy to pay voluntarily to support people who are in trouble. All right. Now, I'd like to ask you this question. Now, do you think it's important um, for government to engage um, the public in decision making? Now, um, talking about the public, right? I meant um, the community groups and also um, organizations. 100%. And there's a problem, right? The, the problem is most of the time, the government wants to centralize control, right? So the real answer is if the federal government says so or state government says so. I think the opposite is true. I think you want as many local people making local decisions. And the response I get all the time is, but these local people, they'll make mistakes. Yes, that's true. We are human beings. We are imperfect. We will make mistakes. It's true. But when some local community makes a mistake, now other communities can watch and see, and the bigger and the, the more senior government can help out. When the senior government makes a mistake, everybody is punished. And they will never admit a mistake ever. They will just double down and make things worse. And I see that again and again and again. Not just that. Local people will know better. And here's the best part. There will always be bullies, people who will try to enforce their will upon you, people who will try to take advantage of you, always. But if I have local bullies, then the state or federal government can come in and help. That's what happened after the Civil War in the South, right? Local bullies, the federal government came in to help. But when you have state and federal governments being the bullies, there is no one to help. So I would like the local people to try to help out and do things right. But even more importantly than that, a local person who lives there and works there has family and children there. That person cares more about the local community than anybody else. If I live four cities away, why do I care what happens in your city? I don't live there. My kids don't go to school there. I don't have family there. I don't care. I just want the money. That's all I care about. However you deal with it, eh, that's your problem. But if I live there, now I care more. So I think exactly the opposite. The more local, the better. The more different. I, When you create a Goliath, I don't want to create another Goliath to fight that Goliath. I want to create lots of Davids to knock down that Goliath. That's what I want. Thanks. Good to know. Um, Larry, uh, I'd like us to um, talk political and social issues. Uh, so what are some of the contemporary political issues that we need to be discussing now in this era of change? Yeah, one of the biggest ones is our education system, right? Right now, education for most countries in this world, I know in America, but for most countries, it is still an industrialized education system. What do I mean by that? It's a system that is made for children to learn, sit in a room, be quiet, listen to authority, do as you're told, and you'll be fine. Well, if your job is to get the person out of school and then go into a factory, that's probably not a bad system. But in most of the countries today, that's not happening. People are leaving and they're doing other things. Automation is picking up most of the factory work, right? Machines are doing most of those things. Now more than ever, I need your brain far more than your arms and legs. I still need your arms and legs, we all do, but I think I need your brain more than I need your arms and legs. We're not training our brain, we're training our arms and legs. We're training us to be obedient, which if you want to be obedient, I guess it's okay. But if you're obedient, how do I get change? How do I get innovation? How do I get pushback? How do I get entrepreneurship? I don't get any of them by obedient people. Obedient people don't make change, right? Obedient people don't grow. So I'm not against you if you decide if you're listening or watching and you want to be obedient, good for you. I'm not mad at you. I just want to make sure that others who don't want to be obedient are able to not be obedient. And that's the issue. So our education system is critical. It has to, it has to start getting kids to make decisions about their lives earlier. We are doing the opposite. We are keeping our children in school longer and longer. And all we're doing is making them children longer and longer. They're not maturing. They're not joining. And now you have someone who's 24, 25 years old, and all they know is, I can take a test very well. That doesn't help you in life, right? Being a good test taker only helps you if you plan to be a teacher, which if you plan to be a teacher, well done, good for you. If you don't plan to be a teacher, that's not going to help you. So you have to be able to make decisions, create things, think on your feet, be innovative. That's what's going to help you in the future. The average person now, particularly a young person, say in their teens or 20s, they're going to have at least five careers in their life. 
not five jobs, five different careers in their life. They're probably going to work into their 70s. Why? Because healthcare is going to be good enough. They're going to want to stay active and busy, make extra money. So they're probably going to work into their 70s. The odds, if you're 20, 30, or in your teens now, you're probably going to work into your 70s and have five careers. Our current schooling system is not helping that at all. In fact, it's hurting it. Oh, right. So uh, now, what do you think um, is uh, the most important problem that is facing the world today? That's a tough question. Um, I would say probably the most important, I think the world, that's a tough one. Because I, I usually think about America because obviously I'm American. And I usually about New York, but I think it does cross over. Um, I, I think the biggest problem, which, which affects everything, is, is this idea that everything has to be put into a black and white, left and right, good and evil paradigm. That's the worst thing. So if I believe you're the bad person, everything you say is wrong, everything my people say is right. I can do anything against you because you're the evil one. And anything I do, even if what I do is evil, is okay because you're evil, so I can do it to get you. When that division that I see even stronger, again, I'm going to focus on America because it's very strong in America right now. It's across the globe, but it's heavily in America right now, more than I think other countries. That is allowing us to not get together to solve any problems. So we can't solve any problems because we're so busy fighting each other. We're so busy yelling at the other that now a political victory from my side isn't me solving anything. It's just you losing. So if you lose, I won. But okay, is our life better? No. Have we solved the problem? No. But she lost, so I won. I think that is our biggest problem because that affects every other problem. I can't fix a problem if I can't get everybody on board to fix it. Whether that's war or famine or climate or any problem you're concerned about, I can't fix it if I can't get everybody on board. Right, now, now talking about um, fixing the problem. So is it possible um, to fix um, the problems that is being caused by other government policies? Now, there had been um, attempts by US uh, law and regulation to achieve this. What would you like to yeah. say to this? I think you can. It's just very challenging. I'm trying to do it. And it's like any problem, right? If you've had trouble with a, a family member or a spouse or a close friend or a business partner, if you have someone who's close to you, who you and that person are just not communicating anymore, you're just fighting all the time, you're not talking anymore, you only have two choices. Choice number one, you depart somehow. You divorce or get away or break your business up or whatever. That's option one. The other option is you get some other person in, a third party, someone else, and they go, hey, 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 I know both of you. Can we have a conversation and try to fix this? If you get the right person, you can fix your relationship, whether that's with your mother or your spouse or your friend or your business partner, whoever that relationship is with. If you get a third party in, you can do it. In America, we have to have a third way, a third party. The, the left and right Democrats, Republicans is not working. That's one of the reasons why I run as a third party. I run as an independent party because I can talk to both sides. They don't hate me yet. Maybe one day they will, but they don't hate me now, right? They, they're so busy hating each other, they don't hate me yet. So if they, they want to hate each other, I can walk in and say, let's have a conversation. Again, if the third party can't make the other two talk, nothing good happens. Absolutely. Thank you once again, Larry Sharp, um, for such an engaging um, discussion, focusing on government and politics. Do you have any projects in the pipeline you'd like to share with the audience of The Backstory? Ab absolutely. Um, if you want to see what I'm doing, please check out Larry Sharp. That's Sharp with an E, and the E stands for entertaining. Okay, that's it. Uh, Larry Sharp with an E. Please do that. If you do that, you will find that I'm on all the, the web things, all of them, from TikTok to Twitter to YouTube to Facebook, all of them. I'm on all of them. Please check it out. And LarrySharp.com will show you my specific policies I talk about. I talk about ways of raising money without taxation, ways of supporting the poor, ways of helping out local communities that don't require any extra budget. So I'm trying to be innovative 
and finding a way to keep everybody satisfied while supporting our working poor and our middle class. Thank you, Neil. Best of luck in this project, um, Larry Schaff. Thank you Thank once you. again. Thank you once again for creating the show. Really at a great time listening to your expertise on the topic of discussion. Now, uh, if you'd like to catch any of these episodes of the Backstory with Mobile Stephen, you can do so on any cost promotion platforms or any podcast distribution platforms to bump into online. Do have an amazing time. Perhaps you'd like to be a guest on the Backstory with Mobile Stephen, sharing disruptive mindset conversations on governance and politics topics or subjects. You can mail me at mobilestephen.org.com or you'd like to get to know more about me or what I've been up to lately. You get to know more about that by visiting my website, www.mobilastv.online. Now I'll be looking forward to your mail, looking forward to connecting with you. We can have a great show together. Till I come here, we need to be good. Sending all my love. Talk to you soon. <laughs>